Hello, uh, welcome to a uh, special presentation on uh, mostly surgical pathology of the heart and uh, vessels. Uh, just an attempt to uh, provide some basics of uh, what we can do with uh, various uh, uh, disease entities that may cross the surgical bench or the autopsy bench occasionally uh, in cardiac and vascular pathology. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, and uh, we will talk about uh, the things that are structurally important to be considered as we uh, look at uh, these diseases uh, and what kind of responses to injury we may get. We'll uh, associate some of those patterns of injury and etiologies with specific histologic changes, uh, in particular those that we encounter in surgical pathology of vessels and so forth. Um, or amputations and discuss the pathologic uh, entities uh, otherwise that will maybe encountered in surge path. So just to uh, sort of review, um, we have uh, both uh, low pressure sides and high pressure sides of the uh, cardiovascular system with the, the pump on one end and the capillary structures on the other. And obviously the uh, uh, structure of the vessel walls uh, differs based on that pressure uh, stress that they face um, and their function with regard to nutrient exchange. Of note, uh, it's usually these um, um, arteriolar level and the uh, medium to small size uh, vessels that uh, govern uh, blood pressure in terms of uh, hormonal and physiologic feedback mechanisms. Um, as we look at that, of course, uh, we recognize there are a lot of factors involved in regulation of blood pressure uh, that can include those things that are associated with uh, 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 vasopressin or vasorelaxation, uh, hormonal uh, stimuli to either excrete or retain uh, increased uh, fluids, uh, and then other uh, various uh, factors like uh, the renin-angiotensin system, uh, the aldosterone system, and so forth, that uh, all play into uh, blood pressure. Uh, fortunately, as pathologists, we don't have to deal with that too much. Uh, we get to uh, look at the uh, consequences, but we don't have to titrate uh, drugs or medications to uh, uh, play around with this uh, balance very much. Uh, also, we can think about uh, patterns of injury and uh, what's going on at the microscopic uh, level of the blood vessels. Uh, from a sort of normal to a diseased uh, pattern. Um, oftentimes the stimuli, the injuries are uh, coming from within the lumen, but uh, not infrequently, uh, some of the response is uh, from within the wall as you get in migration of various things, uh, changes in terms of lipids or extracellular matrix, and occasionally some efflux uh, out uh, beyond the uh, lumen as the HDL uh, interacts. A very commonly seen uh, feature is uh, hypertensive vasculopathy. Uh, we can see this in small vessel disease in uh, biopsies from a number of uh, uh, tissues. Um, not infrequently, we'll see uh, kidney biopsies that uh, show evidence of kidney failure. And uh, we can associate that sometimes with these uh, onion skin-like uh, lesions here stained with PAS uh, that uh, are associated with uh, hypertensive uh, vascular disease and damage. Now, the most common uh, uh, vascular change that we see is certainly atherosclerotic changes. Uh, this is characterized by a uh, fibrous cap with varying levels of cellular and uh, extracellular uh, substance within the uh, plaque uh, that may occasionally become necrotic, um, all uh, subtended by the elastic lamina and uh, the surrounding <coughs> muscular uh, wall. Well, how does a plaque develop? Well, a very interesting uh, process uh, over the lifespan of an adult uh, or an individual that may actually begin in childhood or um, adolescence when uh, some sort of uh, endothelial injury uh, occurs followed by uh, um, intravascular uh, responses in terms of macrophages, platelets, and so forth, uh, developing into then potentially a plaque with uh, recruitment of various things and uh, secondary changes forming these fatty streaks that can be seen uh, uh, really at very young ages uh, in individuals. Uh, 
Uh, and finally, culminating in uh, adulthood and old age in uh, uh, larger deposits, uh, plaques uh, that have the potential for causing disease. I know the risk factors, of course, associated with this, some are genetic and constitutional, while others are modifiable, lipid, smoking, uh, exercise, stress, um, and some may be associated with inflammation or the metabolic syndrome, as well as various uh, chemical or vitamin uh, uh, deficiencies. If we look a little bit more closely at what's going on uh, pathogenetically, well, uh, injury due to uh, hypertension, smoking toxins, et cetera, uh, immune reactions, viruses, uh, those all produce some level of uh, endothelial injury that may allow influx of uh, low-density lipoproteins, uh, may allow attachment of uh, monocytes, macrophages, which can then in-migrate into the uh, lumen wall, uh, interacting with other uh, cells there through cytokines to recruit, uh, ingesting lipids or attracting lipids, uh, producing growth factors that may bring the ingrowth of uh, uh, fibroblasts or myocyte uh, cells, myofibroblasts, and then uh, the occasional efflux of uh, lipids through uh, HDL and so forth. So this is a progressive process over a, a lifetime, um, looking at uh, years, uh, decades, um, but uh, producing a defined effect. Uh, if we look at it in a very early, uh, relatively pristine uh, aorta here, uh, you can still begin to see uh, early uh, uh, plaque-like lesions that uh, basically show just a little bit, a slight amount of macrophages and uh, lipid accumulation here uh, in these cells. Whereas uh, someone in their uh, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s may have more uh, developed plaques that may sometimes calcify or be more established <clears throat> and occasionally even uh, produce ulcerated uh, ruptured lesions. Under the microscope, these lesions <clears throat> show the features we've described with uh, uh, reduced lumen here, but ingrowth of uh, myofibroblasts, the sort of reddish cells here, uh, areas of uh, possible necrosis, uh, some uh, variable destruction of the elastic lamina surrounding that uh, portion of the wall, and uh, variable amounts of inflammatory cells um, and dystrophic calcification. Well, as this process uh, occur, occurs over time, um, certainly uh, there are certain areas more prone to uh, this process, uh, but as these plaques project, pro progress, uh, depending on the location, of course, um, we may begin to enter into one of several potential clinical uh, outcomes, which can include uh, aneurysmal uh, rupture of the wall with uh, leakage of fluids out into the adventitial space uh, and potential secondary damage from that, or can be uh, compromised by uh, acute thrombosis with uh, related either to plaque rupture or some other factor, um, and even sometimes progressive plaques, plaque growth with just uh, complete uh, critical stenosis uh, leading to ischemic downstream changes. So uh, when these uh, things become uh, lethal is when they occur in critical structures like coronary arteries. And here we see such a plaque, a complicated plaque with the area of focal rupture leading to thrombosis in an acute stage and becoming uh, uh, ac acutely occluded or stenotic. Now, uh, this uh, generally has occurred outside the domain of microscopic examination, but more recently, um, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, various uh, optical uh, uh, methods attached to uh, uh, catheters, uh, including optical coherence tomography with a potential near infrared spectros spectroscopy can identify these lipid rich uh, plaques and identify potential areas requiring treatment uh, using uh, an arterial uh, um, angiomicroscopy, essentially. So uh, the, uh, the world of uh, the magic school bus is essentially upon us as these uh, visualizing devices allow us to see what's actually going on in the vessel in real time in living patients. Well, um, moving on to aneurysms, uh, normal vessel here, 
true aneurysm here, true aneurysm here with uh, dilatation either localized or circumferential. Uh, and then we have false aneurysms, which are due to focal mural rupture with extension of uh, fluid uh, into extra mural uh, tissues or potentially uh, dissection within the wall uh, separating these lesions. Uh, now that can happen, particularly when we have areas of weakness in the elastic uh, lamina of the uh, uh, elastic arteries, uh, usually, usually in the aorta. Um, and here we see areas where uh, these asterisks mark areas where we've lost the normal lamellar uh, appearance of the, the elastica. We just have fragmented, scattered areas with interspersed, um, looser areas of ground substance. This was previously termed cystic medial necrosis, um, and this uh, portended uh, potential uh, damage uh, by dissection. As we can see in comparison here, normal elastic tissue stain of a aortic wall shows uh, closely spaced elastic fibers uh, in this wall uh, without air intervening areas of uh, um, uh, non-elastic tissue. So uh, what happens is with aortic dissection, because this, this wall is designed to manage pressures that are distended from the lumen uh, and to resist those, uh, if uh, high pressure fluid gains access uh, to a layer of this uh, wall, uh, it can easily separate and dissect essentially along between uh, areas of the elastic laminae uh, forming in a dissection or a dissecting aneurysm. Another technique that uh, has become more frequent uh, over the course of uh, my uh, career is uh, myocardial biopsy. Uh, indications for this, of course, are uh, monitoring transplantation, evaluating chemotherapy effects, specifically adriamycin, and occasionally uh, detection of uh, rare tumors or localized lesions. Uh, this has actually become a fairly low risk procedure, <clears throat> although it is experience dependent, dependent and uh, is, works best when you have a sophisticated laboratory to apply additional tools like electron microscopy. Um, some primary cardiomyopathies can be diagnosed this way, uh, although usually not required for all of these uh, dilated hypertrophic and restrictive types are usually identifiable by, by means of uh, uh, cardioangiography or uh, uh, other imaging techniques, whereas the infiltrative types uh, due to amyloid, hemosiderin, hemochromatosis, and so forth may require a biopsy, uh, ischemic again, usually by uh, angiographic uh, features. Well, one of the things we're looking at usually for uh, with a cardiac biopsy is to detect the presence of myocarditis. Uh, the Dallas criteria required that uh, to make that diagnosis, you had to have both an inflammatory infiltrate and evidence of myocyte necrosis or degeneration. Uh, using those criteria, there are several approaches to categorize and uh, uh, evaluate these, uh, looking both at temporal sequences and uh, potential etiologies and uh, sort of uh, evolutionary stage of uh, the uh, histologic lesion. Uh, one of the more common features we might see, for example, is uh, giant cell myocarditis. Um, and here we see several of the giant cells that may be present. These may be histiocytes, or they could, in some circumstances, be uh, degenerating myocytes with uh, large multinucleated cells. But we see here dropout of myocyte, evidence of myocyte damage, and associated inflammatory infiltrate, meeting the Dallas criteria for myocarditis. Adriamycin toxicity more frequently requires the uh, use of electron microscopy to detect the characteristic uh, lamellated uh, concretions uh, in these uh, cells, uh, though we can uh, suspect it based on other uh, low power lesions, but uh, less frequently being called upon for this as uh, better methods of uh, monitoring have uh, evolved and uh, use of adriamycin has uh, dropped. Well, uh, in terms of etiologies of myocarditis, in addition to the drug or radiation-induced ones that uh, we've alluded to here with uh, this, we can, of course, have viral or other infectious uh, causes for myocarditis, including even parasitic uh, myocarditis, such as toxo that we have seen in the AIDS population. Uh, but there are also my, um, autoimmune disorders like uh, rheumatic fever, uh, Whipples may be a combination uh, bacterial and 
uh, inflammatory uh, process, and um, uh, more frequently now the uh, transplant rejection issue uh, in patients who have undergone cardiac transplantation. So here's an example. Uh, typically, rejection is diagnosed based on a perivascular and interstitial infiltrate of inflammatory cells, usually lymphocytes, but may have some uh, neutrophils and some level of accompanying myocyte damage, either manifest by edema or necrosis. Um, and as indicated here, you can have some clustering of neutrophils around some of these uh, foci. Rejection is graded uh, as early, moderate, or severe, um, and occasionally uh, resolving. Uh, so uh, just to sort of uh, lift off, list off the, the criteria, for early rejection, you have edema, scant um, uh, infiltrate, um, and uh, a little bit of pyrinophilia of endocardial and endothelial cells. Moderate is usually associated with uh, marked uh, with interstitial and perivascular infiltrate with prominent nucleoli in the lymphocytes and indicating sort of uh, metabolic activity and early uh, myocyte necrosis. Uh, severe rejection is associated with more, uh, new, more inflammatory cells, poly, more polys, as well as some interstitial hemorrhage and necrosis. Resolving rejection may be more likely to be seen with uh, more fibrosis, few uh, lymphocytes, plasma cells, and maybe some hemosiderin. So if we look at this, uh, do we have uh, clues here to say we have uh, uh, myocarditis? Do we have uh, rejection? Well, we have certainly some edema. Is this early? Uh, not very many inflammatory cells here. Um, but we do have a little bit of hemosiderin. So this may actually be late resolving uh, rejection. Um, in this situation, of course, in the appropriate setting. Uh, how about this? Well, here we have a little bit of uh, pyrinophilia of the myocytes, um, and we have a few scattered inflammatory cells. Um, not sure if this is this is really around a vessel, uh, so this may be a very early lesion uh, of uh, rejection. Here, one that's more established. As we can see, there's evidence of myocyte damage. Uh, attacking some of these myofibrils um, and more inflammatory cells. So this would be mo moderate uh, type of uh, lesion. And here a more severe lesion with uh, more established uh, fibrosis, a little bit less inflammatory cells, but certainly evidence of myocyte damage and dropout uh, in this uh, setting. Finally, one thing we should mention is the vascular changes related to rejection, of course, with chronic uh, long-standing rejection, you can get uh, very marked uh, fibrointimal hyperplasia with luminal stenosis, uh, still preserving the elastica and so forth of the native vessel. Moving on to valvular heart disease, uh, it's important to recognize that this is a disorder that uh, will frequently cross our uh, um, surgical bench uh, as cardiac surgery progresses and the history of these uh, lesions is, evolves and our abilities to uh, make the uh, diagnosis uh, and manage the disease without uh, loss of life. Uh, here we can see a, a number of changes in this uh, in this valve, um, a bicuspid valve, either uh, probably a mitral valve. Um, and we, as we describe these lesions, it's very important to pay attention to uh, several features on this. So uh, let's uh, just take a look uh, at why that might be. Well, if we think of the major differential diagnosis in evaluating the disease being uh, just sort of aging degenerative uh, atherosclerotic change, myxomatous or patchless uh, degeneration, rheumatic heart disease versus infectious or other secondary causes. Um, as you look at these uh, gross features, uh, there's a pretty good uh, differentiation just on the basis of gross evaluation alone. So <clears throat> for example, if we see thickening of the leaflets and cusps, uh, that's most frequently seen with rheumatic or myxomatous generation, not typically seen with uh, senile things, although you may get calcification that will cause uh, thickening of those lesions. Uh, Cordy fusion or commissure fusion, again, usually seen in rheumatic heart disease, not in infectious or other things. Whereas uh, def defects in the leaflets, more commonly seen in uh, infectious endocarditis. And rupture of the cordy uh, 
again, more frequently seen in infectious versus uh, uh, myxomatous changes and not in these other uh, etiologies. <clears throat> Microscopically, we can get additional clues, uh, whether there's accumulated glycosaminoglycans, uh, most frequently in myxoid degeneration, whether we have a thinned uh, fibrosa, again, seen here, uh, or whether there is neovascularization more frequently seen in rheumatic or infectious disorders. Uh, so these can be very uh, useful, uh, especially, see, for example, loss of the layered architecture. So using this sort of a differential, uh, which includes a careful gross examination, is very, very important in establishing uh, the etiology. <clears throat> Turning to sort of location-specific diseases, uh, mitral stenosis, uh, mitral valve disease, uh, uh, sort of the typical uh, physiologic issue, but that can be related to either post-inflammatory scarring from rheumatoid disease, calcification of the annulus due to degenerative disease, uh, structural problems leading to mitral regurgitation, um, other issues, inflammatory or other things involving the leaflets or commissures, uh, infection, so forth. Um, and so describing what we're seeing, calcification, uh, rupture of cordy, et cetera, is very, very important. Now, especially if we see uh, papillary muscle attached to this uh, valve, that should be sampled and evaluated microscopically because that can uh, help you with a number of clues uh, to the etiology. Here's a nice gross image and a microscopic image of what this sort of myxoid degeneration can appear like. Um, here we will see um, this sort of patchless appearance, very uh, glistening pattern, no uh, particular leaflets, but we may see these secondary uh, jet injuries uh, within the atrium uh, that can be related to uh, regurgitation and damage of the endothelial there, endothelium there. <clears throat> here's the uh, increased uh, ground substance, here changed, or here stained with an alcyon blue type stain. Another disorder of the mitral valve most frequently is so-called morantic endocarditis. Uh, this is characterized by these granular, uh, very reddish uh, fibrinoid uh, deposits along the commissure line of closure. Um, and these can sometimes embolize, le leading to pulmonary emboli or other, other uh, embolization. Um, and most typically are associated with some sort of a wasting state, although they can also be seen with hypercoagulation or uh, uh, valvular trauma. Aortic valve disease, uh, so-called aortic stenosis or aortic regurgitation can be due to a variety of things, including congenitally deformed valve or the aging process with atherosclerotic changes, uh, but rheumatic disease and other etiologies can also, infection and so forth, can also come into play here. Um, even um, things like uh, Marfan syndrome or a syphilitic aortitis that may dilate the aortic root and lead to an incompetent aortic valve and secondary damage. So uh, distinguishing between primary versus secondary is uh, very, very important. Here's an example of uh, some of the things we might see with rheumatoid heart disease. Uh, here we can see some fusion of the cordy. We also see these uh, little uh, nodular white glistening areas on the cordy uh, on the valve leaflet. These are so-called Ashoff bodies, uh, and these can be seen in, in other areas as well. Uh, microscopically, these are characterized by these sort of uh, caterpillar or wavy uh, histiocytes with uh, wavy uh, nuclei, uh, so-called Anichkow cells. Um, and morphologically, we can see stenosis or uh, tightening or incompetency of the uh, valve leaflets, inability to, to close properly as these uh, cordy become fused and uh, more or less elastic. Another systemic disorder that can impact uh, the valves uh, and uh, heart disease is so-called carcinoid syndrome heart disease, usually seen when you get a very uh, heavy burden uh, involving, tumor burden involving the liver um, and you have active vasosecreting uh, tumor, uh, particularly serotonin. Um, so the features that we would see in that circumstance is this endocardial uh, endothelial fibrosis uh, here seen on a, a an Alcian blue stain to have this very dense uh, thickened layer uh, of uh, endocardium uh, above the uh, uh, myocardial cells. Well, moving on to tumors that we can see in the uh, heart, uh, one of the things that is uh, most commonly seen is the myxoma. Uh, 
Uh, this is 50% of the, the tumors that we're going to see in the heart. These are usually sporadic tumors, but uh, do have some familial versions that can occur in younger patients uh, and even be multicentric. Uh, they are often associated with some level of uh, valvular obstruction or mitral valve obstruction, for example, uh, or potentially with uh, systemic syndromes such as syncope, dyspnea, or uh, embolization uh, if they're uh, uh, right-sided in particular. Here's what they look like microscopically, grossly a very glistening surface, very rich in ground substance, uh, loose, no uh, particular uh, fibrous structure to them. Under the microscope, a few scattered uh, spindle-shaped cells, some loose uh, myxoid tissue, uh, not very much collagen. So the question arises is, are these true neoplasms or are, is this just a, a big organizing mural thrombus? Well, um, Evidence in favor of it being a neoplasm primarily comes from uh, four lines of thought. One is that there are occasional aggressive examples that in invade other structures. Uh, there are cases with malignant transformation morphologically with high-grade atypia, and uh, many cases reveal aneuploid uh, DNA and have chromosomal aberration. So uh, those, are the ev those are the features in favor of a uh, neoplastic uh, uh, feature. These are generally uh, not very immunoreactive. They don't uh, light up with any of the vascular or uh, mesenchymal tissues, no mesothelial markers, no cardiac markers, and so forth. So uh, it's, they're not very uh, fun to, uh, to play around with in terms of your immunohistochemistries. Uh, of note, uh, they can occasionally be associated with glandular elements. So this is a real interesting uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, so the so-called glandular myxoma or myxoma with glandular differentiation has been uh, seen. I've seen a few of these. Uh, they can be very disconcerting. And you raise the question about, well, is this a you know, metastasis from a mucin producing a tumor elsewhere or something like that? Um, and uh, you can play around with these, but uh, recognizing that these uh, glandular myxomas have been recognized as a specific cardiac entity without other um, recognized neoplasia can perhaps give you some comfort that uh, if your initial search for a, metast for a primary site is non-productive, you haven't uh, just missed it. So what other tumors will we see here? Well, there's uh, rhabdomyomas, uh, hamartomas, and then we have the cat and the mice. Calcified amorphous tumor of the heart and so-called mesothelial monocytoid incidental cardiac excrescences for mice. Uh, and occasionally adenomatoid tumors, so a more mesothelial type of lesion without the uh, monocytoid uh, features. So here's a uh, histologic image of what the uh, mice can look like. Uh, here we see these histiocytes and little chains of uh, mesothelial type cells. Uh, these will be CD68 positive. These will be calretinin positive. Um, and so uh, these lesions are typically uh, identified on uh, the valve leaflets and most commonly seen when the valve is replaced. Uh, an even more uncommon tumor is the cystic tumor of the AV node, uh, which has both epithelial and endodermal origin, uh, which suggests it may be related to the ultimal brachial bo body and is often associated with other congenital anomalies. Uh, these lesions can be positive with cytokeratins, um, but do not, and do not have calretinin or WT1. Um, so, uh, usually a pediatric uh, age group uh, lesion and probably more likely to be seen at autopsy than in surgical pathology. Uh, lastly, papillary elastofibroma or fibroelastoma, excuse me. Uh, these, uh, as des described by Dr. Robbins, are curious, usually incidental C anemone-like lesions. Um, and here we see a nice image of these uh, little uh, fibrous cores with uh, loose uh, fibril myxoid papillary uh, lesions around them, uh, and obviously would have some elastic uh, tissue in there as well. Well, just to uh, pull up a few other examples, um, inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor, paraganglioma, hemangiomas, granular cell tumors, neural tumors, ganglioneuroma, teratomas. Uh, these have all been described in case example type lesions occurring uh, primarily in the heart. Uh, on the malignant side, angiosarcoma can also occur and involve the heart, um, usually beginning in the atrium where it presents as an obstructive bulky mass uh, with uh, possible embolic uh, behavior. Uh, here an example uh, from the textbooks uh, showing uh, 
uh, and in the invasive characteristic of this primary angiosarcoma uh, with uh, transmural involvement and uh, growth in the pericardial space as we see here. Under the microscope, here's the uh, typical image, uh, a little bit of lip of uh, fatty cells and uh, very cellular interstitial tissue with uh, vascular channels and uh, atypia. Other sarcomas can also occur here. Uh, again, very rare, unusual. Um, just pretty much the, the list from synovial sarcoma, neural, sar neural tumors, malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumors, Ewing's, um, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, and so forth. I've given you an image here of a uh, apparently biphasic. You can see this sort of epithelioid glomeruloid structure and this uh, interstitial uh, cellular blue tissue. Uh, most likely this is gonna be your synovial sarcoma because that's the only one that's biphasic. And finally, uh, don't forget the uh, lymphomas and metastatic tumors that can occur here. Again, these are usually not uh, sites of presentation uh, but uh, may be seen in terms of secondary involvement. Let's move on to vascular disorders and talk about the blood vessels. Uh, as we think about how to approach uh, vasculitis or inflammatory lesions of the blood vessels, it's helpful to think in terms of vessel size. Uh, so uh, uh, large vessel vasculitis is gonna give you a somewhat different differential than small vessel vasculitis. And uh, medium vessel vasculitis, well, it has some overlaps with both of the other two. So this is the more difficult of the, of the three uh, categories to evaluate. Um, but uh, this is at least a useful approach to begin to think about uh, the kinds of differentials that we may uh, encounter. I I've given you here a, a detailed, uh, a more detailed uh, chart differentiating some of the more common uh, arteritides and uh, some of the features that we might expect in terms of in site of involvement, types of inflammatory cells present, and uh, clinical history, uh, as well as serologic results. Um, and so these are typically the parameters on which this might be evaluated, and generally can give you a fairly useful differentiation of uh, leukocytoclastic vasculitis versus giant cell arteritis, or Berger's disease versus polyarteritis nodosa and so forth, uh, Bichette's disease versus some of the others. Sometimes it's uh, more difficult uh, to uh, differentiate, uh, but uh, this will give you a general guide. I'm not gonna go through it in detail, but uh, you can stop the video if you want to copy it down or uh, make a, take a screenshot. In terms of etiologic uh, causes, uh, these often have an immune component, so that may be immune complex. It may be uh, anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies or other anti autoantibodies. Uh, it may be autoreactive T cells. It may be some combination of those so sorts of things. Um, and uh, we're learning that uh, viral infections, such as the recent COVID epidemic, can play a role in uh, any of several of these uh, etiologies leading to uh, either arteritis or uh, thrombotic events. We'll take uh, the more well-described Takayasu's arteritis. This is a large uh, vessel arteritis, uh, elastic arteries, uh, more frequently seen in Asian populations than women, um, and can lead to uh, very uh, early occlusion um, and stenosis. Um, it also has a, a pulseless or burned out phase as well. Uh, making this diagnosis is a combination of clinical as well as morphologic and physiologic findings. So from a clinical standpoint, uh, you're going to see, um, you know, age of onset, uh, you know, in the mid-adulthood uh, category, uh, differential blood, uh, blood pressures in uh, both upper extremities, some measure of claudication, decreased uh, brachial artery pulses, maybe bruise, uh, and maybe a radiographic abnormality. And essentially, you get three out of the six, and you're, and you're golden. Um, that's always uh, the great thing about clinical diagnoses. Well, in terms of microscopic uh, findings, um, this is fairly characteristic, where you'll see both fibrointimal uh, expansion or in, in enhancement, as well as uh, adventitial uh, accentuation uh, as well. 
and this uh, is due to a, a mixed inflammatory uh, pattern with fibrosis, uh, some level of a giant cell reaction, um, and uh, the interstitial inflammatory cells uh, mostly being uh, lymphoid cells. Um, in contrast, uh, giant cell arteritis, uh, non-Asian population, usually Northern European, um, and slightly older patients, uh, which have a granulomatous reaction, typical granulomatous inflammatory pattern, not just a giant cell uh, picture. picture. Uh, and these patients can have uh, the clinical syndrome of polymyalgia rheumatica. Uh, using uh, angiography uh, or other uh, vascular reconstructive uh, uh, radiologic techniques uh, more frequently used now, uh, you'll see areas of stenosis and, and narrowing, uh, variable areas of involvement. Uh, which illustrates that this is a lesion that can be somewhat patchy. Um, and that's a very, very important thing to understand about that because when we go to try to b make a diagnosis of this disease, which typically has involved a temporal artery biopsy, uh, we needed to have a fairly uh, lengthy segment uh, and sometimes bilateral uh, in order to uh, make the diagnosis. Now, as a pathologist, one should really evaluate the entire uh, tissue submitted, not just representative sections, but uh, totally embed the, the tissue and serially section that to make sure that you're not missing uh, foci of involvement. We've also found that elastic tissue stains can be very helpful to identify potential areas of uh, healed damage, which have lost their inflammatory component, but have evidence still of uh, missing elastica. So here's an example of what we might see. In an active case, we see uh, this inflammatory reaction typically centered around the internal elastica, a uh, mixture of uh, lymphocytes, some inflammatory cells, occasional spillover and associated secondary fibrosis with luminal compromise. Now, if we do an elastic tissue stain, uh, we can see quite nicely here that we have a gap. Here's the normal elastica here around running from 10 o'clock to six o'clock. But from six o'clock around back to 11 or so, we have virtually no elastica in this uh, area. So this would represent an area where the elastica has been damaged. Now, if your laboratory doesn't have an elastic tissue stain, uh, but you have a microscope, you can still do a, a cheap version of the elastic stain by uh, taking a normal H&E photograph and, or H&E uh, uh, slide and uh, cranking down your condenser to increase the refractal in, refractive index in your tissue. And by that means, you can detect these elastic fibrils and differentiate them from uh, the surrounding tissue. Uh, <clears throat> now, this is not as sensitive, obviously, as an elastic tissue, but it can be a, a nice surrogate in a, a rapid uh, situation. Polyarteritis nodosa, PAN. Uh, usually involves uh, medium muscular arteries and typically is uh, adult uh, uh, men. Uh, this is more frequently associated with hepatitis B, which may explain uh, the uh, association here tends to be a little bit more male predominant uh, and can be associated with systemic symptoms. So uh, these are not specific. These don't point to the blood vessels right away. These po point to a systemic illness um, and uh, involvement of various uh, uh, arterial uh, lesions in the peripheral nerves, the GI tract, or, or kidneys is uh, particularly common. Um, microscopically, if we're fortunate enough to have a biopsy, we will frequently see some area of uh, preserved vessels, such as we have here, with the nodosa portion, uh, characterized by potentially fibrinoid necrosis, inflammatory cells, fibroplasia, fibroblastic proliferation uh, around the periphery. So these are usually small or medium-sized lesions, uh, most common in the renal or other visceral vessels, but they spare the pulmonary circulation. There is not any associated uh, anti-neutrophil antibodies. And these uh, patients, about a third, have chronic hepatitis B. And sometimes these complexes of uh, HBSAG and antibodies can be identified in these complexes or in these uh, lesions. It also may affect young adults that has a remitting episodic course with long symptom-free periods. Um, the symptoms are usually due to local ischemic changes. Uh, Long-term, uh, this can be fatal. 
I mean, it can go on and involve other significant vessels, do org end organ damage and uh, compromise life. However, it's very responsive to immunosuppression and uh, long-term uh, remission can be obtained. Looking at a different disorder, Kawasaki arteritis, this is usually a pediatric diseases and sometimes been referred to as mucocutaneous lymph node syndrome with uh, various uh, rash, or oral blisters and uh, uh, lymphadenopathies. Uh, these are again, sort of large to medium and occasionally small arteries, so sort of spanning that group, uh, but has a, sort of a destructive obliterative pattern similar to parley arteritis nodosa. Again, this, is, uh, this one in contrast is not fatal, often is self-limited, but uh, if the damage is such uh, that it affects an end organ, you can uh, end up with uh, potentially significant sequelae. Uh, looking at Church, Church Strauss syndrome, uh, this is a small vessel necrotizing vessel vasculitis in patients who have associated asthma, rhinitis, and some degree of peripheral eosinophilia. Uh, so this might be in a case where you have um, consideration of, uh, you know, Wegener's granulomatosis or whatever, but you have this history of asthma and you have a peripheral vasculitis, then you're going to think about this uh, lesion. Uh, again, these lesions resemble the uh, destructive lesions of polyarteritis nodosa, but more frequently will have sort of a granulomatous character and eosinophils. We can see this involving the skin or GI tract and even um, kidney disease uh, as in uh, uh, other uh, vasculitides as well. Finally, thromboangiitis obliterans or so-called Berger's disease is uh, usually small to medium arteries primarily uh, in the distal extremities and leads to vascular insufficiency. Uh, this is usually younger patients, but patients who have a heavy cigarette smoking history. Uh, this can be related to that hypersensitivity to such a uh, component of tobacco smoke, uh, but we really don't know. Uh, and these thrombi often have very small adjacent abscesses with uh, associated inflammation. So uh, sometimes this is a real nice clue uh, if you have an amputation or another uh, uh, vascular biopsy lesion. Um, and these can extend into uh, surrounding tissues resulting in uh, involvement of those additional tissues. So here's a nice example of those uh, micro abscesses associated with the thrombotic appearance here. And we see the surrounding inflammatory cell. We don't see giant cells uh, and located in the right setting, in the right location. Uh, this should be diagnosed as uh, most consistent with thrombo thromboangiitis obliterans or Berger's disease. Well, uh, I've been doing these lectures as a helping hand to those of you uh, in various other settings, and I hope that uh, you also can be uh, uh, helping hands to other people. Um, and uh, if you have a question, you can raise your hand as well, or more likely I'll be able to respond if you just send me a note. Uh, and I'm always open to that uh, kind of uh, querying. Uh, whatever state, state of disaster you may be uh, ex experiencing. I want to thank uh, Dr. Jing Di, who uh, contributed this nice uh, work of art for our uh, uh, cover sheet and end page, and uh, invite you to subscribe to the channel uh, so that you'll catch uh, future releases. And as always, uh, here's my contact information and how to reach out to me uh, with questions or comments. So until next time, uh, when we'll uh, hope to see you again, uh, I want to thank you for joining me and say uh, be well, take care, and uh, uh, realize that pathology is a team sport. So uh, share with your teammates.